Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you a biblical perspective on the political and social current events in Israel as they happen. What you will hear on this broadcast will contrast sharply with the biased reporting we are receiving from most of the world media. This is the third in a four-part series about Jerusalem. Today we will examine why the world perceives dividing the city of Jerusalem as an option and what is the history behind East and West. On the program today, how did Jerusalem become two separate cities? What were the changes for Jerusalem's Arabs when the city was reunited? Who does Jerusalem belong to? Finally, our panel guests will share their thoughts about East and West Jerusalem and whether the city should again be divided. Over the past 20 years, since the 1993 Oslo Accords, which were supposed to mark the start of the Oslo peace process aimed at achieving a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians, the idea of dividing Jerusalem between Israel and the Palestinian Authority has been a central issue promoted in every proposal and negotiation, not only by the Palestinians, but by the U.S. and the European Union as well. This despite the fact that Jerusalem is the capital of a sovereign nation, Israel, and that the Palestinians have no claim, historically or legally, to the city. Let's go back a little further in modern history and start at the point of the establishment of the State of Israel. In July of 1949, at the end of Israel's independence war, Jerusalem, which was until that time under British control, was split between the young Jewish state and the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. A no man's land filled with mines ran through the city from north to south, dividing it into two, an Israeli city and a Jordanian one. The old city of Jerusalem had been captured by the Jordanians and all the Jews who had lived there before 1948 were forced to flee from their homes to the west side. In the western part of the city, where Israel retained control, most, but not all, Arabs left their homes and went to the Jordanian side of the armistice lines. Arab leaders had encouraged all Arabs to go east so that when they had defeated all the Jews, the Arabs would be able to return to the western side and take possession of the Jewish homes. However, the war didn't turn out as the Arab nations had expected. Throughout history, both Jews and Arabs had resided in the city in small numbers, which increased significantly in the late 19th and throughout the 20th century. The Jews immigrated mainly from Europe as a part of the Zionist movement, and as they developed agriculture and even industry, the newly arriving Arabs came looking for work from Muslim nations around the Middle East. The British Empire had been given a mandate by the Western nations to rule and administrate a great portion of the Middle East. It was to be a temporary entity created after World War I in response to the English and French breaking up the Middle East remains of the Ottoman Empire. So Jerusalem was occupied by the British Army between 1917 and 1948. Meanwhile, Britain created the borders of a brand new country in the Holy Land and gave it to Saudi Arabian rulers who set up a kingdom and called it the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, or Jordan for short. The West had toyed with the idea of making Jerusalem an international city owned by no one and everyone. But in Jordan's 1948 attack against Israel, it seized and occupied the old city of Jerusalem Although it had no legal right or historical precedent to do so, nobody said a word. However, the young state of Israel did have a claim to the land. 
the UN voted to approve the establishment of a Jewish state in the Holy Land. It did not approve for any of this area to be given to Jordan. As we have already said, Israel was attacked by Jordan and other surrounding Arab nations. So Israel was also the defending side in an illegal war that Arab countries and local militias waged against it from 1947 to 1949. This is an important issue that we will get to later in this program. Since being the defending side in a war makes land acquired in it legal. Shortly after the Independence War, Israel made West Jerusalem its capital. Several years later, Jordan passed a similar law announcing East Jerusalem was their second capital, following Amman. Over the next decade, Israel invested heavily in the west side of their city, building the government precinct in Jerusalem, the Supreme Court, our parliament, and many other government offices. Israel also built up many new neighborhoods on her side of the city, which allowed for rapid population growth. On the other side of the border, things were quite different. Jordan never truly invested much into the east side of the city during her 19 years of occupation. East Jerusalem actually experienced a decline in population through much of the 50s, a trend that was only reversed in the 1960s as part of the financial growth the entire region enjoyed. In 1967, the city of Jerusalem was reunited following the Israeli victory in the Six-Day War. The Jordanians lost all their territories in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the border, or more accurately, the ceasefire line, was set in the Jordan Valley, where it remains today. East Jerusalem was then annexed by Israel, and Israeli law has been enforced in the entire city ever since. The transition East Jerusalem underwent was a very abrupt one. The Arab citizens of East Jerusalem who came under Jordanian control in 1948 were now the residents of a nation they had considered an enemy up to that point. East Jerusalem had suffered from long-term neglect and underdevelopment of its infrastructure, a problem that still exists today. The lack of planning in residential areas and lack of business and industrial areas made it very hard to help the impoverished East Jerusalem catch up with the west part of the city. Following the 1967 war, those in East Jerusalem were given permanent residence in Israel. And over the years, some received full citizenship, though most chose not to apply for political reasons. The East Jerusalem residents, who were actually Jordanian citizens in 1967, had their Jordanian citizenship revoked by Jordan's King Hussein in 1988 due to pressure from Yasser Arafat, who already began inventing a Palestinian people. Over nearly five decades since the unification of the city, a visible rift between the East Arab neighborhoods and the West Jewish ones remains. The various mayors of the city over the years have had different approaches to the economic growth of East Jerusalem. Some helped more, some less. Jerusalem's current mayor, Nir Barkat, has made a point of developing East Jerusalem and has worked to close the economic gap between the east and west parts of the city. Despite these efforts, the population on the east side has grown to be increasingly hostile and violent towards its Jewish neighbors over the past years. Since the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993, the question of Jerusalem has always been on the negotiation table. The Palestinians have demanded that Israel return to the 1949 armistice lines, which would mean the evacuation of several large predominantly Jewish neighborhoods and handing over the entire old city and the Temple Mount, a 
again to Muslim control. For their own political reasons, the international community has also repeatedly expressed a wish to see the city divided between Israel and the Palestinian Authority and become a bi-national capital. These claims sound normal in the current discourse regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but in reality are quite bizarre. Here's why. The demand that Israel return to the 1949 armistice lines is based on a claim that Israel is illegally occupying East Jerusalem. The reality is, of course, far more complex. The first problem that meets the eye is that the Palestinians, who are expecting to receive the eastern part of the city in any future agreement, were never part of the war between Israel and Jordan. As I have said before, although no one had given the old city of Jerusalem to the Jordanians, Jordan illegally conquered it during the Independence War and controlled it until it was lost to Israel in 1967. Why do I say that it was illegal? According to many experts of international law, any land acquired in an act of aggression is illegal. Israel was the defending side in both the 1948 and the 1967 wars and can and does claim that its control of Jerusalem and all land it won in those wars should be considered legal based on international law. Here's another interesting fact. The Palestinian Authority, which is a modern version of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, known as the PLO, claims ownership of East Jerusalem, despite never having possessed it and never being assigned to the wars in which Jordan lost land to Israel. In fact, for much of the 1960s and the 70s, the PLO and Jordan were at odds a tension that ended when Jordan expelled the PLO in the 1970 events known as Black September, in which up to 20,000 Palestinian men were killed. In other words, the Palestinian claim that Israel illegally seized its lands in 1967 is absolutely unsupported by evidence. There has never been a Palestinian nation before the 1993 Oslo Accords, and Jerusalem is not illegally occupied by Israel. What does the God of Israel ask from us concerning Jerusalem? Here's a very practical portion from Psalm 122. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. Please stay with us. We will be back with our panel of Israeli guests to discuss whether Jerusalem should be divided as part of the peace process and what the biblical answer to this question is. Maoz Israel Ministries is a Messianic Jewish nonprofit organization based in Tel Aviv. We exist to be a witness of the good news to the people of Israel through outreach, discipleship, and raising up godly leaders. We translate and publish outstanding faith books in Hebrew and powerful testimony books to reach non-believers. We have a Hebrew outreach website with original media content produced by our team. We support the Hebrew-speaking congregation Tiferet Yeshua in Tel Aviv. We sponsor and host seminars and conferences. We support our Arab Christian brothers who love Israel and the God of Israel. Our I Stand With Israel Fund serves as a benevolence outreach, meeting the practical needs of Israeli believers. Our dream is to see God's promises fulfilled until the day when all Israel will be saved. Welcome back to Israel Frontline. We have our panel guests in the studio and we'll now see what their answers are to the demands to divide Jerusalem. Joining me today are Mati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TBN Israel, Shani Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, 
also from Jerusalem. And Israel Pachter, pastor of Beit Hallel Messianic Congregation from Ashdod in southern Israel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. It's good to be here again. Shalom. Shani, although you and your husband Kobe are Israelis, you are also have American citizenship. Some of your children were born in Jerusalem, so they also were able to receive American citizenship, although they're native-born Israelis. What is written in their U.S. passport as to the city and country where they were born? You know, we were both surprised and disappointed when we uh, discovered that two of our kids were born outside of Jerusalem, and they have their city um, within Israel, comma, Israel. And uh, when we received our children's American birth certificate, it just said Jerusalem, comma, with no country. They forgot to write it in. The right. computer so, went well, down. We would have uh, been happy to note that. However, we did inquire, and they said since the ultimate status of Jerusalem has not been decided by the United States, it is therefore Jerusalem, comma, Jerusalem. It's That's ridiculous. And every president of the United States, before he's elected, promises to, to make there. Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Wait, forget what the president says. There is an American law, a mm -hmm. Congress decision, and a bill that says that the American consulate and embassy are to be in the city of Jerusalem. Sure. And every president, including both Republican and Democrat, decide to postpone that decision. And, and the Congress agrees with them. Well, yeah, it's sort of a presidential decree. They say, let's, let's wait with this one. This is political. Yeah. Let's not make any bold statements. And they sort of just, you know, wait, wait on that decision every time. But wait, I got a question. The conflict is over the old city of Jerusalem, the and, east side. And my children were born in the western side of Jerusalem. So the western part is the world thinking of giving the western part of Jerusalem also? A why, why do they say, well, we have not made up our minds yet whether to have our embassy it's more just in a, your case? It's a status quo issue. It's just that any kind of declaration in favor of Israel is going to cause potentially some sort of protest, and so they're just not making any decision at all. Well, there's more to it than that. I mean, it's not, it's not just a political issue. It depends who you ask. If you ask Israel, Israel is the, or Jerusalem is the capital of the state. If you ask the Americans, they don't want to give you an answer. If you ask the Palestinians, they'll say, no, no, not just East Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem is our capital. And we'll see if you're allowed to stay. It's not even a question of you know, East and West. So it's, it's more complicated than that. There's a lot right. on the well, table. Well, all of Jerusalem is their capital, and all of Israel is yeah. Palestine. So. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so Israel, how many embassies of anybody in the 173 nations of the world, how many are in Jerusalem? Uh, actually, I don't know about anyone. No, I think there might, might be... I don't think there's one, any. No, one like small state, uh, no. an island state. None. Or, none? None. None. Sure. You see? Isn't that unbelievable? Unbelievable. Well, they, they were, just for the sake of the viewers. Till 1967, the right. embassies were in Western yes. Jerusalem. Some. And, some. <clears throat> and after 1967, when, when Israel took over all of Jerusalem, yes. they pretty much withdrew, every last one of them withdrew from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, or essentially anywhere not yes. in, uh, in Jerusalem. But you know, it's amazing to think, uh, we live in, we are independent country, state of Israel, we say to the world, Jerusalem is our capital, we have all the rights to decide, and, and they say decide, that, well, we're not really and sure other about countries that. say, yeah, we're not sure, we're not agree, think about Sweden, yes. you know, like changing their capital and all the world will say to Sweden, even no, went, no, no, we're not agree, it's wrong. They yeah. went further, because when I, I remember going to uh, the States when I was in high school, and I was talking to some people, in high, uh, you know, they were high school age like me, and, and they said, oh, you're from Israel, uh, you know, and then we got into discussion, and they were actually taught in school that the capital of Israel is Tel Aviv. Which really? at first I just thought they were completely <clears throat> ignorant and then I realized that that's actually what they were being taught. So it's, it's, it's kind of nebulous when you go on the political, but in the schools that's what they're telling the wow. American students. Is there any other country in the world that uh, has decided what their capital is and then the rest of the world doesn't accept it? Well, any there, other country? Is there any well, country not, not in the sovereign, world that... Not a sovereign existing country. That it's, yep. it's never happened. Well, it probably there's 173 not... sovereign nations. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in regional disputes, it is an issue. Yeah. But we're, we're an existing country. Jerusalem was the capital. It wasn't this new thing You're that right. came out of war. Right. It already was the capital, already recognized. And then they're like, oh, we don't want to get into this political discussion. Let's just, you know, totally. wait for you to fight it out or something like that. Yeah. And you, you ask about spiritual side of it. And it really looks like 
You see, all the world feels like they need to say to Israel what to do, what to decide, what have to be their capital. It's and even it's sometimes... It's usually the opposite of what Israel wants, right? Yeah, so it make you mad or just laugh of it well, and make it funny. Well, it's not just important to the state of Israel, it's important to the enemies who hate Israel and it's important to God. And he yes. speaks about it, you know, endless times throughout the Bible. He says, yes. Jerusalem, my city. I yes. will restore yes. my kingdom in Jerusalem. So it's not this, again, it's not this like, you know, floating around in the air idea. It's a very yep. clear, Jerusalem is where God wants a city. Mm -hmm. And therefore, those who are not with God don't want his city to be in Jerusalem. Israel, why does so much of the nations, so many of the nations in the world, claim that the old city actually belongs to the Muslim world. That's what yeah. we were just talking about. Yeah, I think it's just based on feelings, all different feelings, to be fair, to be proportional, you know, to take care of the weak one, because you see, the picture uh, people have about Israel, it's like a monster, big, strong country that controls the whole Middle East. And it's actually wrong, totally wrong. It's small, very Wait, tiny we're little about country. Eight million uh, Israelis, citizens, yeah. of which a million and half, half are Arab. And then we have a few hundred million, well, we have 1.6 billion Muslims. So they're the victims, and Israel is this monstrous army country, right? Yeah, this is the picture that was drawn. And of course, in fact, we have totally different reality. And uh, I believe in the Bible. So because of the Bible, uh, reading, for example, Zechariah, he says that nations that fought against Jerusalem eventually will, will come to worship God in Jerusalem. Yes. And the, the first part is fulfilling already. Nations feel like they need to do something about Israel. Mm -hmm. They need to be engaged and, you know, to demand, to tell. Well, we do have Christians, don't we, coming every Definitely. year to worship in Jerusalem. And they believe that's... Um, foretelling of what's going to happen. There is day. something to what he said about, you know, it feels a certain, like, why do people say it's Islam? Because a, a lot of modern culture based their opinions on what feels right and what kind mm -hmm. of feels the clearest. Yeah. And, and for all intents and purposes, the Islamic world does a cherry of a job um, making their case. And they have more emotionally. people. They, emotionally. And they have more people out there to make their case and to sit on the internet and, and spew whatever. Make it sound whatever. like they're the underdog, though they're like the... Right. The biggest and there's the so many of them religion. to yeah. say they're the underdog that that's the, that's the message that gets out. Right. So. right. Yeah. Shani, although it appears that East Jerusalem Arabs are opposed to Israel, I hear these funny little stories about... Would these Arabs actually want to be transferred over to a Palestinian country? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question because I have a lot of Arab friends, specifically in Jerusalem, and it is fascinating to speak with them. I actually went to the old city and um, was uh, talking to a shopkeeper, and he was explaining to me that there's the Arabs of 1948, and those are the ones that are Israeli Arabs, and then there's the Arabs of 1967 who according to him, were actually just Jordanian citizens who lost their citizenship. And he said, you know, I could get Jordanian citizenship if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But I would mm -hmm. rather stay here under a refugee status, you know, his non, his kind of permanent residential non-citizen mm -hmm. status. He prefers it because his life is better here than it would be in Jordan. So ideologically, they want Palestine. They don't actually want to live there. <laughs> they just want it to exist because ideologically, it just should happen. You know, it's kind of like... But if they get what they want, then no, this, they no, these no, poor they, people Because they want to it be, to exist, but they, but they want, don't want someone they don't want else to, be part to live of it. there. Yeah, they okay. just want it to exist. They, it's a you know, kind of like Palestinian like pride thing. Spiritual victory, you know, yeah. for my God, yeah, I mean, for my faith, for my yeah, religion. It is. That's the a good point. The best indicator, though, is real estate. Is real estate. If you follow what happened in Israel, Israel started in 2002, started erecting the security fence. And it was sort of people understood that if you're outside of that, you're going to be in what might be uh, Palestine in certain areas of Jerusalem. And what happened was this mass immigration of anyone who could move into the non-Palestine side in Jerusalem. And the real estate, which on, on the Palestinian or the, the Muslim neighborhoods, excuse me, used to be much cheaper than the Jewish side. Now Palestinian neighborhoods or Muslim neighborhoods, again, again are more expensive in certain areas than the Jewish neighborhoods because so everyone's what you're moving saying in. saying is that when they found out where the fence or the wall was going to go up between the Palestinian Authority and Israel, many, many Muslims wanted to move over to the Israel side and before the fence went up. Yeah. Palestinian Christians and yeah. and, and, and anyone who could get out from yeah. what, what they expected to be the Palestinian yes. Authority 
tried to move into what was supposed to be Israel. And they, well, they told me, they said, look, on, on the Palestinian side, there's just nothing. There's no infrastructure. They're not building anything. Right. The Palestinian Authority is not designed to build a society. They are completely focused on tearing down Israeli society, right. but not in building anything that there is That's to a hopeless live situation. Yeah. I think that would do. Let, let's look at the legal side for just a moment. There are those who claim that Israel's refusal to hand over East Jerusalem to the Palestinian authorities is a violation of international law. Where in the world do they get this that it's a violation to international law? Monty. Well, let, let me lay it out really simple. That's not true. I'll explain. Israel was the defending side on all war, wars involving uh, Jerusalem. And according to international law, they say you can't acquire land by force. But Israel wasn't the one who used force. Israel was defending itself, and you're allowed to defend yourself in war. That's not illegal. More, more than that, the Palestinians were never side to any of these uh, uh, battles. They were just, you know, in certain cases, residents of those areas. Mm -hmm. It was Israel and the Jordanians. And the Jordanians never owned that land fair and square. They took over it illegally. Yes. Again, right. this is very simple. Yeah. So... Well, I mean, it's almost I, like it's almost like uh, yes. if, if I walk into a museum and I see this painting of Van Gogh, and then this guy walks up and he's like, "Oh, this is a family heirloom. I'm going to walk off with this painting." And so there's this battle between the the museum and and this guy, and yeah. I'm like, "Well, I saw the painting, so it's actually mine." And it, it's just the <laughs> the <laughs> absolute absurdity of this third party uh, ownership. Okay, is well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. That's it for today's Israel Frontline. Thank you for watching. We hope you gained a deeper insight which will help you in your prayers for Israel. For more of my articles about Israel, sign up to the free monthly Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. Don't forget to join us next week for the conclusion of our four program series about Jerusalem. We will present to you the different versions of heritage stories which exist about Jerusalem and tie it in with a biblical perspective of the war over the city. On behalf of our team and myself, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv.